So last time we looked at the Tarski Vought criteria, which is something that we're going to use next in to show the reflection theorem holds. So we'll proceed directly to that. Um, first, though, that I wanted to just emphasize that this absoluteness idea that we've got, this actually holds for a wide class of formulae, just purely syntactically, because of the way that they're simply built up from atomics. If you build up from atomics just using bounded quantifiers, remember that bounded quantifiers only refer or can only quantify over sets, the members of sets that you may already have. They don't quantify over the whole universe of sets. So in these formally built up using bounded quantifiers, propositional connectives and so on from atomics, these are called the delta zero formulae that we've mentioned before. So these can be shown to be just outright absolute for transitive Ws and Zs. Right? Again, emphasize transitive because such classes have no epsilon holes. So this is uh, lemma 239. Now, let W be a transitive class term. Then any delta zero formula is absolute for W. And again, that means between v, W and V. So in general, if we mean between W and V, we don't mention the uh, we don't mention V if it's understood. So actually, all you have to do is apply tarski walk criterion to any delta zero formula together with its sum formula. So just to recall, a delta zero formula is one built up from atomics by use of negation and or, and then bounded quantifiers. There exists VI in VJ, rather than just general existentials. Right? I bound where I look for VIs to become from VJ. So the idea is then that phi vector list phi and all its sum formulae and apply and apply the argument of the last lemma. So in this last step, I mean, just to try and 
go back to where we were, recreate where we were. In the proof here of this last lemma, and we're trying to go from two to one here, we want to apply this criterion to deduce absoluteness. Criterion then is just about this existential case. Well, an existential quantifier, right, if it's bounded, if there exists a vi in vj psi, say, this is really, there exists vi, and now we say vi is in vj and psi. So I can think of a bounded quantifier. I can kind of temporarily unbind it as it were, but actually I'm going to restrict the vi's to vj's all along. So I can think syntactically of this as just being this. Okay. So I could apply the previous lemma 238 with a task you criterion in it and see what happens in this existential case. Well, the existential case in the proof of the last lemma was, well, there is an x phi j. So if I now just think of this X as being a bounded quantifier, okay. now, as W is transitive, it has, as it were, full epsilon information. About its members. So when we come to the induction step, of proving that task evil criterion just for delta zeros, I've got some phi which is now saying there exists an x in some y psi here. Again, psi some delta zero. Then I can just run the argument awkwardly goes over two pages of paper here. Yeah. I can run precisely this argument here if I wanted. Maybe, maybe I should do that. Why, why didn't I try that? So you see it one more time. So I'm thinking of phi i then. Okay, there exists an x in, let's say, z and psi, and here we have x, z, and y vector here. So this is some phi j on the list. So we fix y vector and z here in w. So this is really phi i about the y vector. Yeah. So I have phi i y vector. Okay. This is I'm now just writing it out. There exists an x in z, phi j x z y vector. All of this in w, relativized to w. So this is equivalent to there exists an x such that x is in z and phi j x z, sorry, z, y vector w.
by the definition of relativization, that same way exists in X in W, right? Such that X is in Z and phi J X Z W vector here. And I relativize this formula. Well, this is an atomic, so relativized to W is just itself. So I'm just relativizing this here. So I use the induction hypothesis here. to replace this W by Z. So that's the only difference there. This is a shorter formula than phi I. We're assuming that inductively is shown to be absolute. No, sorry, so Z in what we're doing here is V. So let me just cross this out. Okay, so if there is an X in W, then there is an X in V, such that this here holds. So this is just equivalent to saying there is an X in V such that x is in z and phi j x z y vector. And I just unwind, I just write that as there exists an x in z, such that phi j x z y vector. But this is just phi i y vector. So the moral here is, when this is just a simple bounded quantified statement here, I just prove absoluteness here outright. I didn't have to actually use some kind of criterion. All I just used was this inductive hypothesis. Right? If this was already shown absolute, if it held in W, if and only if it held in V. So the moral then is that we can show that delta zero formulae just simply are absolute as long as the W is transitive, right? Q. Uh, we use the transitivity of W to go from right to left here, to go from here to here. We use the inductive hypothesis here in this point, and here is, is over here. So we'll use this property quite often, right? probably even without mentioning it too much. Right? Delta zero formula is simple enough that they're just simply absolute. If you compute their truth values in transitive classes, they don't require any complicated searches. Okay, so now we'll continue to 252 and actually look at reflection itself. So here we are in section 252, reflection theorems. So the essence of the argument I've said here is this lemma 240.
So again, think of Z as V. Here. So I take a class term here. Now I'm thinking thinking of Z as well. Maybe, maybe it does look like V. Right? And moreover, we've got a way of slicing up Z in the same way that we can slice up V. I can arrange Z as a tower of Z alphas. You might ask, well, why doesn't he just have done with it and call Z V? Well, we're going to use this with other Zs later on. In fact, with the Girdle constructible universe, we'll be using this. So Z will be L at some point. So I'm assuming that I've got a way of going from an alpha to a Z alpha. So there's a function uh, which I call F sub Z. This gives me Z alpha, it's a set here in V. And again, like the V alphas, the Z alphas accumulate. So if alpha is less than beta, then Z alpha is contained in Z beta. And at limit stages, we take unions. So F lambda happens to return the union of the previous F alphas. And Z is the whole shoot. So very similar kind of picture to V. Right? So what does the lemma say? If I've got Z kind of filtrated like this or is it represented as a tower like this? So, so that was all our assumptions. The conclusion star here is that from ZF, I don't need choice. I can prove for any alpha, there's a beta bigger than alpha, such that, oh, and I've missed out what the, for any phi vector. So I think of phi vector as being a finite list. Here, yeah. the phi vector is absolute for Z beta and Z. So again, that's saying for any alpha, you give me an alpha, I can find a beta here. So it's the truth value of all the formulae in the list is the same evaluated in Z as in Z beta. Right? And if there are any free variables in the formulae, if they're not just sentences, this is true when I evaluate these formulae using gadgets from Z beta using parameters from Z beta. So Z beta is reflecting the list by vector from the, the, the class Z itself. Okay, so Let's see how this works. Right? 
So we're going to apply the criterion 238. And well, Z will be Z from that, that lemma. W will be, we're trying to find some W, this will be Z beta. Such that the part two of the criterion of lemma 238 applies. So proof. So we aim to apply lemma um, 238 with Z as Z, but W there as some Z beta. For which the criteria two of lemma 238 holds. So again, just to flash it before your eyes again, I mean, it's there in the notes. This is the criterion at two, right? If for any gadgets from W, if there is an X in Z, it says that I can make phi J X Y vector hold in Z, then there's an X in W. So this is the kind of thing we're aiming. We're trying to find a Z beta for which this Holds with Z beta in place of W. So the problem, as it were, is okay, I may be able to find an X in Z to match up with this Y vector to make this true in Z. But I want to be able to kind of shepherd all of these X's for this choice of Y's into one place, into some Z, Z beta, right? So what I keep doing then is I start out with the alpha you've given me. I need to find a, a larger beta. So I look in Z alpha, I look at all the Y vectors from Z alpha and I look through the, my universe in inverted commas Z to find X's, if there are any, that'll make this true. And if there are such, I look and see in which Z beta they lie. So I'll do this for all the Y vectors that there are. This will give me a whole load of ordinals. I just take the supremum of that set of ordinals. So I'll know that for any y vector in W, if there is an x, there'll be one in z of that supremum. I just have to look far enough through the z hierarchy to find these x's. So the name of the game is just to identify how far to look to find these existentials, witnesses, these x's that will go with these y vectors. So we'll go sufficiently far up to find these X's. But then the problem is we've now got some more Y vectors because we've, we've increased, increased our Z alpha up to some Z beta. And there are more Y vectors in Z beta to consider. So we do it again, right? And then we do it again and we do it again. We do it infinitely often and take a supremum over everything. And then this will give us this will have closed off to be reminiscent of our closure arguments from before. We'll have closed off and found a supremum of supremums, this beta of the lemma, where for any y vector in the z beta, if there is an x, I can find an x in that z beta, such that this holds. And then we'll have absoluteness for that z beta. <laughs> Okay, so the theorem or the lemma stated is about this phi vector. Um, I'll throw in all of the subformulae of the formulae here if they're not already there. That just means I just make the list a bit longer. So I'll assume that the list is subformula closed. So we assume phi vector is subformula closed. 
Okay, and that doesn't change much. That's just by lengthening it if need be. So the list goes from zero up to N here. So we define functions F zero up to Fn. So one function for each of these formulae here. And these will go from ordinals to ordinals here. And it's only interesting when phi i on the list again is one of these existential quantified formulae. So we look at this interesting case first. So if phi i is of the form that exists x, phi x, y vector, we first define g So gi of this y vector, okay, we'll set it to be the empty set of zero. If there's no x, it'll make this true in z. So if it's not the case that there is an x here in z, that'll make phi x y vector here true in z. Maybe phi i just isn't true for this choice of y vector anywhere. Okay, in which case gi returns zero on this y vector. Otherwise, it returns an ordinal eta where eta is least, such that I can find an x in z eta, such that phi x, y vector holds in z. So it's an either or, right? Either we can find, we can't find one or we can, and we can and we can find one in somewhere in z where all everything in z is in one of these z alphas. So we're seeing where to look. Now what the fi function does on some ordinal psi is it looks at the supremum of the gi y vectors where y vector is in z psi. So it's a tuple of gadgets from z psi. So if I restrict my attention just to parameters from z psi, if phi i y vector holds, I can always find an instantiating x in this level of the z hierarchy. This is how far I have to go here if I allow the y vectors to vary over z psi. Notice that this here is um, a perfectly good set. Here's a set of objects. It's the range of this function on this set. G here, this is a perfectly good definition by a term of this function G. So I'm applying this function to this set. I've got a set of ordinals here, so I can take its supremum. And this will be an ordinal itself. Note um, fi is size defined um, by the axiom of replacement. 
as z xi is in v. Right, so, so what else do we want to know? Fi is monotonic. If zeta is less than psi, then Fi zeta is less than or equal to Fi psi. I don't know if it's necessarily increasing. So, but it can't get smaller because in Z Xi, there are more Y vectors to consider than in Z Zeta. So the GIs, GI will increase, or at least not decrease, when it considers Y vectors from Z Zeta or from Z Xi. So there are potentially more ordinals here when this is Xi. So this is potentially larger, which is what's written here. So this was all under the assumption that phi i was one of these interesting things. So that defines fi when phi i is interesting. When phi i is uninteresting, we just let fi be the zero function. So phi i not of this form. So we set uh, phi i of psi just to be the zero function for all psi. Yeah. So now we're moving towards the, the crunch point. Now, in the statement of the uh, lemma, we're trying to prove star here. For every alpha, there's a larger beta. OK, so you give me an arbitrary alpha, and we find a larger beta where this is going to hold. So we'll define a sequence of ordinals which will be closing up under the fi functions and the supremum will be closed under the fi functions for each i and we'll get absoluteness. So the claim then is for every alpha there's some beta bigger than alpha and it'll be a limit ordinal and for all psi less than beta, and for all of the fi functions, fi of psi is less than beta. So this is, um, the alpha you can think of as the alpha that you gave me at the beginning. And this beta will furnish the z beta for absoluteness, which is kind of what this is saying. It's been designed to say here. So we prove the claim, which is really the proof of star. So we define by recursion on omega.
Well, let lambda zero be the alpha that you give me to start with. Lambda k plus one, I'll let it be the maximum of this finite set of ordinals. Lambda of k plus one, this plus one is here only just to ensure that the lambda k sequence is strictly increasing. That's the only point of that. And we look at F zero of lambda k up to Fn of lambda k. So I go through the, the formulae on the list and for the interesting ones, of course, the uninteresting ones, this is just zero. For the interesting ones, it's telling me look higher, look higher to find where those existential quantifiers can find witnesses. Right? So I do this for all of the finitely many formulae at once. Right? Right? Using parameters from Z lambda K. So I have this larger lambda k plus one. And now I do it again, looking for parameters from z lambda k plus one. And okay. So this will imply that if I look at the supremum, over k of these lambda k's, this will be my beta is a limit ordinal, right, which checks that there. And we'll just check this last bit here. I have to pick something that's less than beta. So if tor here is less than beta, beta is the sup of the lambda k's, then tor is less than lambda k for some k in omega. Okay, f is a non-decreasing function. Sorry, fi is a non-decreasing function for any for any i. fi of tor is less than or equal to fi of lambda k. But fi of lambda k, it's one of these things, it's less than lambda k plus one, which is less than beta. But that's all we needed to show. I needed to show that in xi less than beta, fi xi is less than beta which is what we did here. We picked something less than beta, fi of it was less than beta. So this concludes the claim. Yeah. And now one just wants to see that the claim actually tells us exactly what we want for the lemma. Right? So it takes a little bit of reviewing, I think, checking out to understand what's going on here. we want for the clause star of the lemma. After all, what, let's see, let's find star again. Right, here it is. Here's the alpha you gave me. Here's the beta that I've constructed. And what we've got is that this beta is closed under the fi function, right? For any i. 
So for any phi i of an interesting phi i from the list, if for any y vector from z beta, if there is an x that'll make phi vector x y vector, sorry, phi i y, phi j y vector x true, there'll be one in z beta. Just check. If phi i is of the form, there is an x phi j x y vector. And y vector is in z beta. Then it's in some y vector is in some z lambda k. But then if there is an x in z such that phi j x y vector holds in z, what I have then here is that, sorry, g i of this y vector here, this is less than f i um, lambda k here, which is less than lambda k plus one, which is less than beta. Hence, there is an x in z lambda k plus one, there is, then there is an x in z beta. So if we already have absoluteness of this shorter formula between z and z beta, then we have indeed absoluteness of the whole formula. So that's going to finish the <clears throat> that lemma, that key lemma there. So let's just, uh, the bottom of the page is the actual statement of the montague levy reflection theorem, which is basically a corollary of the, the work we've just done. So let phi can be any finite list of formulae of our official language. Yeah. And ZF proves for all alpha, there's a larger beta such that the formulae are absolute between V beta and V. So all we have to do here is just set V to be Z and Z beta to be V beta. in the above. So this is the official statement of the reflection theorem there. So on the top of page 33, there are some observations. So the first observation is Instead of taking formulae, we could take 
sentences. In fact, we could take axioms, right, of ZF here. And then since all axioms are true in V, we can find a V, v beta where they're absolute between V and V beta. So the axioms are gonna be true in V beta. So in particular, if these phi vector here are axioms of ZF C, right, then since they hold in V, We shall have in ZF, we can prove for all alpha, there's a larger V beta, such that the axioms hold, the conjunction of all the axioms hold in V beta. I don't have to say if and only if they hold in V because they do hold in V. So they hold outright here. So we can find arbitrarily large beta for which any given finite list of axioms hold. So the vector here means a finite list. So to paraphrase, for any finite list of axioms, Or ZFC, there are arbitrarily large V beta. Arbitrarily large beta. 